This episode is brought to you by Sheath. You can go to sheathunderwear.com and discover the most comfortable underwear ever created. Now, what makes sheath underwear different? Well, for men, on the inside of the underwear, there is a dual pouch. That means separate compartments for your manhood. Imagine a silky, smooth pouch on the inside that your boys slide right into that keeps you separate from your legs so there's no more sticking, no more chafing, no more need for readjustment. We all know that little move you have to make to kind of peel the bad boys off of the leg. Well, with sheath, that is a thing of the past. There are several fabrics to choose from, from modal to bamboo. My personal favorite is the bamboo. It's a newly launched product that everyone seems to really love. I highly recommend trying the bamboo sheath underwear if you have not ever given yourself the gift of true comfort. Wearing these underwear truly sets a new precedent for what underwear are and for most people, I think they end up switching entirely over to sheath because when you put on your old underwear after trying these, they just don't cut it anymore. You can try sheath risk-free. There is a 100% money-back guarantee on your first pair. So go to sheathunderwear.com and use promo code TIMEWHEEL to save 20%. I've been involved with Sheath since its conception. It was founded by my brother, Robert Patton, who is a US military vet, who during the course of his two tours to Iraq, developed this product out of need. Need is the mother of invention, as he likes to say. And he did a great job bringing this awesome product to the world. Again, that's sheathunderwear.com promo code time wheel this episode is also brought to you by ohana kava bar go to ohana kava bar.com and check out their selection ohana means family and it is spelled o-h-a-n-a and kava is spelled k-a-v-a you can order directly from their website and they will mail you high quality kava. If you don't already know, kava is a plant medicine, an herbal supplement, a replacement for alcohol. It is an incredible experience. I have used kava for years now. I love it. It makes you chill, happy, vibey. It is a communal and ceremonial beverage to unwind with at the end of your day. If you haven't given kava a try, I highly recommend it. Again, go to ohanakavabar.com and use promo code TIMEWHEEL to save 10%. Their store offers classic kava, instant kava, kava tinctures, kava capsules, and more. All of which I have tried and all work incredibly well. ohanakavabar.com Promo code TIMEWHEEL.
Accessing archive. Authorizing. Access granted. Accessing file. Alright everyone, welcome to the show. I'm sitting here with David Krantz, a musician and epigenetic coach. How's it going today? It's going pretty good, Matt. Looking forward to chatting with you here. Awesome. Thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. I've been uh, jamming your stuff and, and you know, for a while now we've, uh, we've worked together on a couple of projects under Time Wheel and I've just always been so impressed with... Uh, your music, it seems extremely technical. It seems extremely fine detailed and um, very kind of techy sounding, um, but psychedelic and visionary at the same time. I'm, I'm very curious, um, when did you begin your journey with music? How old were you? What got you interested in music? And um, just so the listeners know, you go by few texture. And uh, I'd like to as well jump into what that means and, and how you came up with that name. But first, let's start with uh, how did your journey with music begin? Because you're an absolutely amazing music producer. Yeah, thank you. Well, I've been making music since I was probably about five years old. Um, played, started playing violin around then. And it was, it didn't stick very long, but I, you know, when I was younger, I, I kind of switched from instrument to instrument, um, played saxophone and piano and, um, landed on guitar for a while, you know, and I was like 12 or 13 really got into being self-taught. You know, I'd always taken lessons when I was younger. I always learned to read everything through notation and totally rejected that when I picked up guitar. I was like, nope, I'm learning tabs. I'm, you know, going to watch Jimi Hendrix videos and just like figure it out on my right. own. Um, right. And so I think that set me up pretty well to, you know, explore electronic music once the tools got in my hands. Um, mm. You know, so I, yeah, so I, you know, played various instruments, picked up guitar in my teenage years. And then when I got to college, um, my roommate had a copy of Reason, um, mm. music production uh, software, and um, very quickly got engulfed by it um, and ended sure. up uh, ma majoring in music and music technology. And kind of through that process, uh, and, and it's like, you know, I was doing an audio engineering program and the music I was making simultaneously had nothing to do with it and everything to do with it at the same time. Like all the things I was learning in, in school, you know, applied, but it was totally mm -hmm. outside the realm of like school projects or things like that. Mm -hmm. So I, um, and, and also around that time I, I was playing with a band where I was producing and playing keys. We were kind of like a live electronic trio, uh, before a few texture emerged. So a lot mm -hmm. of my, um, approach really came from a live music perspective at the beginning Mm -hmm. Um, and then the detail and the, uh, <laughs> the perfectionistic obs obsession with, you know, audio scapes and things like that kind of emerged from there. Uh, once I really, um, you know, got interested in, okay, what can we do with these tools? What can we do with sound? What, how can, how can I create things that haven't been heard before? Um, mm -hmm. so, you know, that's a, that's a lot of. Well, I'd say what drove a lot of my earlier work, like just novelty for the sake of novelty, you know? So you get a lot of the, mm. the glitchy detailed stuff out of that. Right. Um, wow. We have a lot in common there because I actually used to play uh, synth and keyboard for a rock band as well. Mm -hmm. And I started on piano because uh, I just grew up in a house that had a piano and I would play it and like the way it sounded and stuff. And over time, would learn very simple songs, um, covers and that type of thing on the piano and eventually uh, started getting into kind of industrial rock music. And mm -hmm. then we would uh, start covering stuff like Nine Inch Nails and stuff in this rehearsal space we had. And um, my immediate thing I gravitated towards was uh, synth and, and piano. So that's a funny thing there. And I'm sure you are also a, a, a synth um aficionado if you're interested in playing keyboards and that type of thing and i believe i heard in another podcast you worked with moog for some time mm -hmm. yeah i worked at the moog factory for a couple of years was a calibration engineer with them 
uh, tuning Voyagers and uh, Mother 32s before they left the factory. Um, Beautiful. But yeah, you know, it's funny. I'm kind of in between synth gear right now. I just sold a lot of the stuff I had and and mm-hmm. sort of looking to rebuild my collection here. Um, sure, I don't know what sure. that's going to look like. I, I've been holding off on getting into modular stuff for a while because I know the, the, the rabbit hole it can be, but I'm, I'm feeling like the gravitational pull is, you know, sucking me into, into the, into the modular world probably pretty yeah. soon. So I've been seeing that movement grow. Um, ton of people are just fascinated with the modular stuff and it seems that to be some type of return to the tactile, mm-hmm. because I know for a lot of us, we shifted into, um, DAWs, digital audio workstations. And, Um, it's very easy to be very productive with those things, but you start to kind of miss the tactileness of twisting knobs and plugging things in and, you know, uh, uh, hearing things affect real time through circuit boards and circuitry because it's so easy to just, you know, do so much with your mouse and keyboard these days. And, and it kind of, while it is super productive, it also, um, leaves a little something to be desired as well when it comes to music, because I think, you know, most people in music, it starts as a very tangible tactile experience, you know, with instruments. And then as you learn how to produce, you're like, Oh, I don't even need these things. (laughs) I just do it all in a VST. You know what I mean? So that's funny. Is that, is that how you feel about it too? You just want to get back to the old twisting the knobs. Yeah. You know, I, I have a lot of mixed feelings about it because on one hand, the, the the fluidity and ease of being all in the box and all digital is so nice um and yeah it does leave a lot to be desired though in terms of feeling it interacting with the instruments like all of the unique weird little happy accidents that happen through analog circuitry that you can't really replicate digitally it's like you sometimes you just stumble on that perfect combinations of of settings that for whatever reason like it's just in it, it's more in the moment it's really here and now oriented as opposed to you know it's it, it's easier to feel like well i'm just looking at a screen you know i'm just looking at knobs on a screen right um, yeah yeah i feel pretty similarly um, but you know what, for me, like, actually I, I just finished up an EP and actually just got the final masters back right before this call. So kind of funny, oh, awesome. kind of good timing. Um, and I don't know exactly what I'm going to do with it yet, but put a lot more acoustic instrumentation on, on, on this one than any of my previous works. And part of it was really missing that tactile feel, really yeah. missing being able to like directly express something into my computer rather than trying to you know just go into the computer and have and have it express something back at me in a way sure. um so so yeah I, I feel like part of the the reason i chose so much acoustic instrumentation was to really get back to that sense of of, of interaction and um, mm-hmm. being able to like articulate and channel feelings in a more direct way too right but when you listen to your music, it feels like every almost millisecond, there's a new thing happening. And so it just, that's what I meant earlier when I said it seems hyper detail oriented. I'm curious, what is the concept? You know, what is the inspiration behind this music? What type of spaces is this inspiration emitting from? And what are you trying to build uh, with your music? Yeah, so it's, at its core, really inspired by dreams. Uh, the, the name few texture actually came out of a dream. Like I woke up um, and just had that word in my hand. I was like, oh, well, this is what this music is. Cool. All right. We'll go with it. Awesome. Um, and, you know, it, it's funny. I if, if I track back through kind of my catalog, <laughs> like a lot of those songs had some origin in a, in a dream or like a snippet of a dream. Mm-hmm. And, um, the the quality of that ever emerging newness and and weird strange things coming out of the blue like it, it feels like it mirrors dreams and I, I really appreciate the way you asked that question because it actually is is causing me to think about it in a slightly different way of like all right where is this coming from like i've known you know the dream state is an influence the unconscious and yet i actually had never really tied that together in terms of the quality of 
you know, new glitchy sounds kind of emerging all the time, being pretty close to what happens in dreams. You know, there's always totally. something weird happening. Do you have a pretty um, vivid dream world? Do you, do you relate a lot to dreams? Is that a big part of your life? It 100% depend, depends on how much weed I've been smoking. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to get in the topic of cannabis. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, but yeah. But, and, I, and I relate there because I, I, I'm a daily toker as well. It's actually been a honing way back, and I want to get into that. Um, and definitely the, the more it's honed back, the, the more intense and vivid the dreams are and even the lucid dream aspects. But but yeah, but, but tell me um, about the type of dreams you've had and... It sounds like, you know, uh, it's some type of ins- source of inspiration for you. Um, do you have any, like, dreams that kind of repeat themselves or that leak their way into reality? Because I just had a podcast with Eric Godsey, and we talked about how somehow or another, sometimes in dreams, a thing happens and then later happens in reality. So it's like, that's a really weird connection going on where you can be asleep and then later on in reality something that happened in your dream occurs in reality that's just a really weird thing that's really hard to explain yeah absolutely i've had a few weird little time slips over the years like that and things that sometimes will show up as like um like a deja vu type feeling and then i'll realize oh i dreamed this before weird Mm -hmm. yeah okay yeah um but yeah i've had a dream practice for a pretty long time on and off you know i think when i was about 15 or 16 i got really into lucid dreaming and um really you know it was kind of like uh in that phase of like first time i did mushrooms first time you know consciousness Mm -hmm. expansion oh lucid dreams are a thing wow i guess i'll I'll, you know check that out and Mm -hmm. I, i would say on the scale of being a natural lucid dreamer to not i'm way on the not really a natural lucid dreamer side mm-hmm. gotcha. um i can induce them occasionally but um yeah. really for me it's more just paying attention to what's showing up and looking at the themes and um mm-hmm. noticing how characters change you know that's mm-hmm. been one of the biggest things for me that i've tracked over time is how dream characters will have this certain persona or attitude or role that they play and a lot of them are, for me personally, like a, a lot of people that I've known in my real life show up in dreams. Um, and they'll take on these roles in dreams that are consistent. And then over time, sometimes they'll shift or change. And I can, I can sometimes track these very specific events, you know, in dreams or in my life that mirror each other around different parts of my psyche emerging and, and evolving and changing. Mm-hmm. Um and I'll say that the the record that I just finished um, is pretty much one is very a hundred percent based on dreams here. Um, awesome. It's actually came out of the blue, really. Like I, I was, so I'm I'm in a master's program right now, getting a mental health counseling degree, and I was taking a dream work course this semester, a, a transpersonal dream work course, mm-hmm. and um, you know, part of the explicit like framework for the course is like, okay, we are engaging with the unconscious. We're intentionally engaging with a field that we're creating that we're all a part of. And at some level, we're all influencing each other's dreams, you know, in obvious or very subtle ways. Uh, And so part of the way that we structured and the the course and, you know, the activities was like, we were actively trying to feed that field to try and like do things to participate in that distributed collective field of consciousness. And Mm. um, one of the things that we did was, um, you know, we each posted our dreams each week, you know, into a discussion board and then um, read them and tracked themes. And Mm. so these songs actually emerged out of reading other people's dreams and also some of my own dream themes that started to feel like they were just getting kind of congealed together in this weird, like, um, Mm you know, we're all, we're, we're like all dreaming variants of the same dream through our own lens. Um, and of course the content looks different, but it's like when you immerse, when I immersed myself in it, it was like, wow, this feels so mm-hmm. specific. And so I just tried to turn whatever that was into, um, into these, these tunes. And, right. Um, yeah. Some people think that we're going to some type of, uh, Akashic records zone or astral plane uh, when we dream. And that's kind of how people can leak into our dreams and we leak into theirs. And 
sometimes you might have a similar dream the same night as one of your friends. And it's like, what's happening there? Because if this is just random chance of, because, you know, the scientific way of looking at dreams is what it's doing is it's essentially filing your memories. It's saying, okay, we're going to like compartmentalize, you know, like the things you need to remember. And we're going to throw out the things from yesterday that you don't need to remember. Cause there's certainly a ton of detail and information we take in every day that our conscious mind doesn't need to remember, you know, it doesn't need to remember what color the cup is that you drank coffee out of yesterday, but it does need to remember, you know, uh, the fact that you made this big commitment with a buddy to start working out more or something like that. So, you know, like the way they kind of imagine, uh, the way that science imagines dreams work is it's, it's sorting the things that you need to know versus the things you don't need to know. And we're just kind of getting meshed up in this like process of, the filing of these memories. Um, but then in the more metaphysical spiritual aspect, it's kind of like we're leaving our body and uh, going to some higher realm. And maybe other people are there at the same time we are there. It's almost very like DMT esque, you know, what, what are your thoughts on this? Ooh, we could talk for a while on this one. So my, my sense is, Hmm. I, I, I actually take a little bit of issue with, with saying like the scientific way of looking at it is, is the memory consolidation, uh, you know, kind of viewpoint because, you know, there's a lot of different theories on it and that, and they're all theories at this point, you know, sure, like sure. some of, some of them have more of a basis than others. But I think when you really zoom out and look at the last, you know, let's say hundred years of, um, of science, you know, even though the the transpersonal nature of dreams, it's totally outside the realm of, you know, materialist ways of viewing reality. Mm-hmm. There's still so much good data on the subjective and meaningful experience of dreams as mm-hmm. catalysts for, for transformation and self-awareness and, um, and certainly full of like anomalous experiences like that so much so to the point that you know like what you were saying before about precognitive dreams or yeah. um you know people having um uh, collective dreams of of planes going down before 9-11 all these things yes. you know like the, right. the, the the big bubbling up of things that people pick up on through through the through the psyche um 100%. like th- there's enough of those things at this point where it's like the the quote unquote scientific materialist rationalist way of, of denying those things is actually pretty unscientific because it's adhering to the dogma of those things are impossible. Therefore we can't study them or consider them science. So like my sense of it is that, um, that yes, all those things are true. Like dreams, you know, do serve some sort of, uh, function around sorting out memories and, um, Mm -hmm and all that on, on, on one level, but it's multi-layered and multifaceted, you know? And, yeah. um, I really don't have a good sense of like how it ties into like astral realms or things like that. Like, I mean, when you look at like the Tibet, have you ever like looked into the Tibetan dreaming practices? The you know, A bit. Like, you know, I'm not stuff? super versed on it, but I did uh, read several articles and probably watch a, a short documentary on, on it. And, they live whole lives uh, just a dream. Like it seems like, from my understanding, is their whole day is the not real, and their dream is the real. Yeah, like you know. Yeah, absolutely. And there and there's a couple other cultures around the world that that's the norm. You know, a couple mm-hmm. tribal cultures. Um, but yeah, when you like the the Tibetan stuff is so interesting because a lot of the core, at least in at least in uh, like bomb buddhism uh Mm -hmm. which is like the the native religion of tibet like a lot of the the core teachings of that have been transmitted through dreams like transmitted through intentional lucid dreaming from previously incarnated masters to presently living people and Mm -hmm. like there's this tradition of of this this transfer of dream knowledge that happens and it's like i mean it's totally mind-blowing you know it's totally and, and it's also like the essentially the practice for the for for dying you know it's the it's the learning to navigate the liminal spaces so that when you know you 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 die like you have the map of the tibetan book of the dead like you have that the bardo map 
essentially right. you've already done it you know you've already been there and like you kind of yeah. know what the what it feels like to be disembodied and, and doing right. that so 100%. like with that in mind it's like of, <laughs> I, I don't know what they are. You know, I, I know that there's something much deeper about them than I can possibly comprehend. And I will say like, um, you know, I just took this three month, three and a half month course with, it was very intensive. Uh, and I feel like I understand dreams less now than I did at the start. <laughs> which, <laughs> Isn't that funny how that happens when you start studying? It's like, Oh, I know less and less about it actually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it, it's liberating in a way, you know, it's like, Oh, I don't have to be the expert on that. I, there's no way I could be. Right. No, similar thing with psychedelics. It's like, as you start looking more and more into it, the less you can really explain what's going on, because it's just ineffable. It's beyond language. You know, it's funny because it starts, I feel like, you know, for me and, and for a handful of friends, we got interested in psychedelics and we're like, oh, we want to learn everything about this. We want to do it more. We want to get our sea legs in that space. We want to understand how to navigate it. But it seems like the more you try, the more mystery is uncovered. And it's very similar thing going on with the dreams, you know? And it's funny, like thinking of dreams as such a beautiful part of life, but so many people also just think of them as a byproduct of sleeping. They don't think of them as something to learn from or something to to be inspired by, you know? It's just like, oh, I had it. And, and I also wonder what is why do we have bad dreams? Why why are they scary sometimes? Why do they freak us out and we can't sleep? So I keep keep waking up having bad dreams. Like, is that trying to deliver your psyche some type of message about something that in your life that you need to let go of or change? But sometimes it's not so clear. Sometimes you totally have a dream and you can directly correlate it. Oh, that tells me to stop doing this other thing in life. And I can I get the message clear. But a lot of other times it's like, what does that mean? I'm having, I'm struggling to understand what that dream is trying to tell me, you know? Yeah, yeah, totally. And it's, uh, it's fascinating to see what happens. Like once you really focus in and amplify one of those dreams that doesn't have a clear meaning, you know, you start working, working on it with someone and, and talking about it and, 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 and engaging with it. It's like, it often feels like, like a telescope that can just zoom in infinitely where it's like there's infinite meaning that you can make from it. And um, sometimes it's the dreams that feel the most mundane and, and silly and short. And it's like, what does putting a worm in a chest of drawers on a, you know, airstrip have to do with anything? That was just like right. this one little scene snippet. And then you unpack it and it's like, oh, wow, that's so rich and meaningful and weird. And, you know, mm -hmm. it ties into so many other things. It's um, weird because, you know, there are symbols and you can look up the symbols and there's glossaries and, you know, like indexes about what symbols mean in dreams. And part of me is like, that's helpful. But another part of me is like, you're supposed to interpret it yourself with your internal psyche, with your internal meaning making system, because just to read what other people said, what, what if that leads you astray? You know, I don't know. Yeah, exactly. And, and here's the thing about dreams is they're, they're, they are multi-layered. Like on one hand, sometimes that type of symbolic standardization helps. Um, but exactly as you're saying, like, you know, symbols are mutable depending on your personal associations with them and mm -hmm. dreams are simultaneously very personal and totally not at all they're so they're also expressions of the collective unconscious and in, in my sense it's like there's often a gradation you know some dreams are more personal based some pe dreams are more transpersonal um and you know connected in in, in nature um but sometimes it's like, it just depends on what angle you view it from. You know, sometimes it's like the, 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 like, like I'll sometimes go back and, and, and reinterpret dreams that I've already had a salt, thought I had a solid meaning to and find that it actually just translates to something totally different now, mm -hmm. you know? And it's like the, the, not just, not just dreams as these like, you know, nightly events, but then how do they actually stack up on top of each other to like form this, this lifetime hologram thing that then you can look back into and, and see how those meanings change and emerge and, and evolve over time. You know, like I was saying about the dream characters before. Mm -hmm. um, and aliens too. Why are aliens entering dreams? Cause I've had uh year, uh year 
four years now, I've had alien dreams, mm-hmm. dreams of UFOs, dreams of aliens coming to Earth. Maybe they're already here. I don't know, but I don't know what these dreams mean. They're interesting because I've always been interested in, in aliens ever since the first earliest films like Independence Day that I saw. I was like, oh, I like this. This is interesting. But I don't know why I keep having recurring dreams of aliens coming to Earth. You know, like in one dream I had, I was on uh, like a top floor of a beachfront hotel and I'm out on the patio and I just see this this thing coming and it's coming and it's coming. And as it's getting closer, I realize it's a UFO. For sure, this is a UFO. And then it smashes into the room and annihilates the building that I'm in. I don't die. I'm able to get out and then end up in the street and there's hundreds of people screaming and the waves are crashing up on on the the building and um i never saw the aliens but i certainly saw a ufo um smash into the room that i was in so it's like what is that you know mm-hmm. <laughs> have you had an alien dream well let me ask you this how were you feeling in the dream when all that was happening i remember feeling like i needed to find my brother um because when I came back into the room, it was like there was a party happening, but everyone had evacuated and I didn't know where <clears throat> everyone had gone to. And of course, there's a there's a whole um, frenzy happening in the hallway and in the staircases and everyone's trying to evacuate, evacuate. And then you know, I, find, I find myself in the street looking for the people I know, the people that were in the room that I care the most about finding, you know, and my brother was one of them. And um I don't remember if I found him or not, but I remember that was like the primary goal. Mm-hmm. 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 So one of the frames I like, and you you may already you know have used this or heard of this, but maybe people listening haven't, is like looking at all as all parts of the dream as an aspect of yourself. You know, mm-hmm. like the the like you know, and the question might be, okay, you know, what is the, U- what part of yourself does that UFO represent? You know, what part of you is foreign that's crashing into this, this structure and, and mm-hmm. destroying it. And, um, you know, and, and same thing with characters. It's like, you know, mm-hmm. you can dream of, dream of your brother and it's, it's very easy to think like, Oh, my brother's in my dream, but mm-hmm. it's actually your own psyche creating an image of your brother that mm-hmm. is really representative of some part of yourself and you're, you know, symbolically your brother makes sense as a stand in so that you can have a reflection of that part of yourself in a way. Yeah. Oh, I like that. I like that. I'm going to think more about that because I don't always, you know, I'm not a master dream interpreter or anything like that. Um, I, I studied it, you know, here and there, probably primarily through Wikipedia and YouTube. So not a lot of credible sources there, but I do find what I can kind of pull from what I've, you know, seen and, and try to connect some dots there. But, but now thinking of, uh, more of these are all elements of my psyche and not, I'm the, I'm just the observer of the dream. You know, that's pretty interesting actually. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a very Jungian way of, of looking at it, you know, mm-hmm. very much in alignment with kind of that way of, of looking at dreams. Absolutely. That's beautiful. So speaking of dreams and cannabis, um, why is it that cannabis allows us to not really dream? I mean, cannabis seems to prohibit dreams. And the more you smoke, the less you dream, the the less you smoke, the more you dream. What is the relationship there? Mm -hmm. So I think it, I'm not a thousand percent sure on this, but um, I know that THC uh, impacts the acetylcholine system in the brain. Uh, which is involved in memory formation. Um, mm-hmm. And so THC is an acetylcholine esterase inhibitor, uh, meaning it prevents the um, uh, it, it, it prevents the thing that prevents the breakdown of acetylcholine. So as a double mm-hmm. negative, it basically lowers your acetylcholine levels. Um, and so something like um, galantamine, um, which is um, a supplement or it, it's an extract from red spider lily, um, they actually use it to treat Alzheimer's too, but the people use it as a, a, a lucid dreaming aid, um, mm-hmm. improves dream recall and lucidity. And it does the opposite. It actually, um, increases acetylcholine le- uh, levels in the brain. So, um, mm-hmm. I am guessing that that's what it's from largely. Um, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. I'm, I bet there's other things too, but that's, that's my working understanding yeah. of it right now. 
Well, just as a guy finding interest in this and not having much, you know, background in an official study of it, um, my way of of rationalizing what's going on is, you know, sometimes when you smoke, not every time, but especially if your tolerance is low, you kind of have these like daydreams, Mm -hmm. kind of visions, if you will. And I almost feel like it uses up your dream juice while you're awake so that when you're asleep, you're out of dream juice. Your gas tank is on empty. Um, and there's pros and cons to that. The pros are you're getting this kind of lucid dream. It's kind of more like a daydream, though. Um, but it can certainly take you to these internal scenes. Um, again, especially if your tolerance is low or, you know, you do something kind of heavier like like a, you know, like a bong rip or, you know, something that's going to like really uh, hit you hard. Um I find myself listening to music and being able to like see these almost music videos unfold, um, on a low tolerance, uh, level. Um, when you have a high tolerance level and you smoke every day, all day, you kind of don't feel that different. You kind of just feel like, you know, normal ish, you know, like, because I feel like, you know, you can get pretty regulated with cannabis and it just feel like your new normal almost. Um, um, but, Again, that's my way of interpreting it is like you're using up all your dream juice and therefore you don't have any when you go to sleep. What do you think about that? I actually agree. <laughs> like like I said, it's all multi-layered. It's all, you know, you can look at it from different angles. And that's been my experience too, actually, you know, especially for me when I get habituated to it. Like actually, if, if I just use cannabis, uh, you know, say I haven't used it in a month or something and I just use it one time it actually won't really impact my dreaming too much, but it's that repeat use over time that feels like it depletes whatever uh, ability there is to enter that astral space or whatever that space is um, Mm -hmm. definitely depletes it for me too. Yeah. Yeah. And that also leads me to ask about cannabis because I, I've had, uh, I was listening to a number of your other shows and um, it seems like you understand the epigenetics of cannabis. Um, it affects different people in different ways. And it's very easy for, you know, so like, a, like a newly donned stoner to think, this is the best thing in the world. Everyone should do it. Like, it's, I feel amazing off of it. Why wouldn't everyone do this? But then other people have the experience of every time I've smoked, it, it was terrible. Like, I couldn't wait for it to end. So, you know, I wanted to kind of dive into your understanding of the epigenetics of weed and um, how it affects different people in different ways. And then overall, what is epigenetics? Yeah, sure. So epigenetics, we'll start there. You know, epigenetics is uh, the study of how genes change their expression over time. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is, you know, you have... Um, your specific set of, of DNA that makes your hair color, the color it is, their eyes, the color they are, and all of the biochemistry of your body, the way that it is, you know, the, you know, the, um, the way you're set up, but that's not a static thing, right? Like you got to have different hormones firing when you're waking up in the morning versus when you're trying to go to sleep. You got to have different neurotransmitters firing when you're trying to study versus when you're hanging out with friends. Um, you got to be able to fight off, you know, viruses and, you know, bacteria. And there's a, a very different biochemical milieu or, you know, kind of situation going on when you're encountering these things. Mm -hmm. And genes, what, you know, they create the instructions, right. For all these different, um, potentials, you know, for different hormones, neurotransmitters, all of the biochemistry of your body. Uh, but it doesn't need to be turned on all the time. You need these Mm -hmm. certain tools to show up at different times and be regulated well. And that's really what epigenetics is describing is this ability for the body to turn on kind of the instruction manual and little, you know, biochemical factory that is our body uh, yeah. in response to different things from the environment. So, I mean, really, you can sum it up that epigenetic, epigenetics is how our bodies respond to the environment. Gotcha. And, you know, epigenetics can happen like in response to, you know, say, 
um, living in a polluted city for a long time, or it can be in response to exercising every day, or it can be in response to eating a Big Mac every day versus eating, you know, a, a salad, right? So you get these like health promoting, health detracting things that influence epigenetics. But the other thing about epigenetics is that it's actually also responsible for these longer term cycles, like mm-hmm. your hair going gray or women going into menopause or these mm-hmm. like, you know, de- or developmental, you know, losing your first tooth, like all these, all the growth processes of the body are controlled mm-hmm. by epigenetics. That's like, all right, we're going to turn on this gene at this time so we can produce, you know, this next phase of growth. Mm-hmm. Um, and the other piece to it, which I'll, this is, I promise this is the, the final piece to it, um, <laughs> is that it can be transmitted, um, through generations, there's transgenerational inheritance of it. Um, and so this is, um, you know, very, very different than traditional like Mendelian genetics where it's like, you know, your, your genes are just a combination of your mom's and your dad. And it's like, that's it. Um, there's actual, there's a lot of evidence now that, um, you know, the health condition of your parents, what they ate, what exercise they did, were they under stress or not, that also gets encoded into the next generation. And if you think about it logically, it makes sense. Like the body would want to prepare the next generation for whatever conditions are present, right, at that time. And, um, you know, this is actually one of the area reasons I got really interested in it. My grandparents on my mom's side are Holocaust survivors. Uh, grand, grandfather was in multiple concentration camps and uh, actually escaped on a death march two weeks before the war ended, like oh, ran wow. off into the woods. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, a lot of trauma. Um, right. And there's pretty strong evidence, you know, scientifically that children and grandchildren of Holocaust survivors have abnormal stress responses, um, mm-hmm. you know, as a result of that. Um, I certainly did when I was younger and I've done a lot of work to try and kind of counterbalance that and mm-hmm. learn how to regulate and, um, you know, balance my nervous system. Um, but that's one of the, I think, big takeaways about epigenetics is, um, it really actually does matter, you know, what you're doing, not just for mm-hmm. yourself, but for your kids and their grandkids and beyond that. And it wow. matches up 100% with all of the indigenous wisdom around what you do, you know, is going to impact seven generations down, down the line. Wow. Wow. I did not know that much about it. That's interesting. And it actually makes a lot of sense that, um, the things that go on in your family before, you know, you're encoded by that as well. And I guess something that came up in me during that is, um, is it some, you know, is what's encoded into you, what's going on with your parent at that time they conceive you? Or is it a history of what had gone on with your parent all the way through their life up until the point you were conceived? Because what if they were having an extra stressful past year, you know, as, as you were conceived as a child um, versus, you know, like it was all good for a long time and that gets coded into you too, mm-hmm. or, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, it's both. It's for sure. Both. It's like, okay. there's, there's both that, that kind of long-term health trend and then acute things that are going on. Mm-hmm. Um, probably the, the, the acute things are gonna maybe take a little bit more precedence. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's, it's actually, it's definitely both. And where, um, kind of those accumulated health, factors and resilience factors are going to matter. And then so is like the immediate environment, you know? Right. Right. Well, to speak to things like cannabis and even alcohol, um, is, is your reaction to those two substances informed by your parents and their either lack of use of it and or abuse of it? It's a really good question. I mean, that, that from an epigenetics perspective, I don't have the answer, but mm-hmm. from more of like a, from a genetic perspective, um, that's where a lot of my work is, 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 uh, is focused on, um, understanding what the, the reasons why, you know, what, what are the reasons why people respond to cannabis difference differently, like you said, right. and, um, over the past, mm, let's see, tw- 15 years, there's been a pretty good amount of research on it, actually, like surprisingly amount 
a surprising amount of research um, mm-hmm. looking at you know what specific ge- genetic variants can we identify that create these different responses. Um, mm-hmm. And that's a lot of the work that I do with my coaching clients, uh, which is, you know, looking at the genetics to then inform the epigenetics to say like, all right, how are you wired at the very basic level? And then what do we know that will create positive epigenetic outcomes based on those genetics, right? So mm-hmm. for, some, for, for someone that's wired in one way, um, you know, eating a vegan or vegetarian diet might actually work really well for them. But then mm-hmm. someone who, say, has genetic variants that re- ha- cause them to re- require higher amounts of B vitamins or iron or, um, mm-hmm. you know, protein, things that, like, these are just not going to work well with that. Um, mm-hmm. You know, there's a whole different set of parameters to, to, to think about mm-hmm. with those people. So we kind of applied the same thing to, to cannabis. Um, and, you know, just to kind of give your audience an idea of um, the scope of it, like uh, I was doing a lot of nutritional genetics work. Uh, and then I think around 2017, I found some stuff on cannabis and was like, wait a minute, no one is talking about this. Like mm-hmm. there's mm-hmm. nothing out there on it. Um, so I kind of made it my mission to, um, take some of that, not that research translated into things that people can actually understand and read. Um, and also over the last, um, couple of years have developed a genetic test, uh, in collaboration with the on genomics, um, mm-hmm. that can actually tell you information about, uh, your genetics and how that will influence, you know, your metabolism of CV, of THC and CBD and mm-hmm. some mental health risk factors and some cognitive factors. Like, you, you know, that there's people out there that are highly functional stoners. And yeah. then, you know, there's people out there that can't get off the couch, can't find the keys and it just right. doesn't work. So, um, there's actually quite a bit of, good mechanistic research to like explain why that is where um you know for example there's a there's a gene called comt and it's a really well studied gene it, it's involved in the dopamine system in the brain and they found that when they give people thc acutely and then measure their short-term memory uh after they give them thc there's one version of that comt gene and, and this is you know a commonly distributed variant you know it's like about uh, there's three versions of it, and it's like pretty evenly split. About a third of the population has one, third has the has the other, and the third has the other. Um, so these aren't like rare mutations or anything. Uh, mm-hmm. They found that when they uh, gave those people THC, and I think in this study it was like 15 milligrams of oral THC, um, people with one version negligible decrease on short-term memory, and the other group had about a 40% decrease. Oh, so. Wow you can imagine how that might translate to someone being a functional stoner or not. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. That's super interesting. Um, something that I wanted to ask is, um, I feel like this is in relation to epigenetics and cannabis is how sometimes cannabis, it it can, the effects of cannabis can change for you, maybe depending on how long you've used it, these types of things. So in my personal experience, um, there was an initial phase where cannabis was a highly altered state. It was pretty much like going into a psychedelic experience. Um, Then I feel like I got into a pretty deep relationship with it where it actually almost started to function as some type of attention uh, assistant. It would help me stay on task it would help you know it would help me dive deeper into work you know whether it be creative work or even just like things like emails i could stay on task it was this focus it was this ability it was helping me focus for a long time and um and then you know several years of using it that way it then started uh making it harder to focus Mm -hmm. and not only that, but start maybe getting some of those anxiety attack type situations. So like from going to such a profound psychedelic experience to a focus enhancer to then something that changed almost completely and it made it harder to work under the effects of cannabis, whereas previously it made it easier to work. And in fact, amplified my focus and my energy and my inspiration 
like what what do you think's going on there because i don't think it and i know that maybe you could say it's strain dependent and these type of things but uh, i don't know i get some kind of sense like the way my body is reacting to it has changed through using it so much but what, what is your view on it yeah i would i would say that that's a pretty spot-on way to think about it uh i, I think a lot of people overemphasize strain uh, mm-hmm. personally like there's definitely different strains that have different effects but it's in combination with that underlying tendency of each individual person. And I've experienced similar changes over time too. A lot of people that I talk to have, uh, and certainly there's an epigenetic component to that. Like when you use THC regularly, it epigenetically downregulates the expression of cannabinoid receptors on the surface of cells. Um, mm-hmm. so that there's, you know, and that's what more tolerance can you know come from to in some respects is that those um those receptors are are less abundant they're less sensitive to make up for the amount of cannabinoids that are all of a sudden you know in the system now um and i don't think there's a really clear answer yet in terms of some of the more subtle dynamics around like you know it changing from something that was focus oriented to anxiety provoking right um but yeah. it, it sits within that 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 system of you know being able right. the body trying to maintain homeostasis in some way, right? Well, the kind of like um, plant medicine slash plant spirit um, explanation that I've heard talked about and resonated with it, uh, on some frequencies is it's a trickster plant. <laughs> so sometimes that you know they say he's there to help. But sometimes he's there to trick you and kind of play a little game on you, you know, the, the, the spirit of the cannabis, you know, so to speak. Um, they call it a trickster plant. I've heard it tens of, of times, you know, tens of times they say cannabis is a trickster plant. Um, whereas, you know, some, you know, they, they're called different things, you know, like ayahuasca is a master plant, you know, like they call mopacho a master plant, you know, which is tobacco in, from the Amazon. But cannabis, they say, is a trickster plant. And People that actually take ayahuasca and stuff kind of abstain from cannabis. Um, but as someone who's had such a romance with it, and it helped me for so long, um, it's 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 pretty surprising that something that I felt I would be identified with for life, <laughs> right? Like, I'm a stoner for life. This is the best ever. And then you find yourself, you know, five years later um, saying, I need to smoke way less, right? It's like it's not helping anymore. Um, it's a weird thing to go through because again, there's this romance with it. It's kind of, um, it's, yeah, it's like, it's a partner of yours, you know, like Kid Cudi says it's his girlfriend and stuff. And, you know, you can relate to that when you're in that stoner phase, like, yeah, Mary Jane's my girl, you know, like she's never going to leave me. And, you know, this is kind of the Kid Cudi vibe, but, um, I mean, I related to that and a lot of the stoner esque music, you know, Snoop Dogg and these types of things that as I was first discovering it and, I would almost never get anxiety at the beginning. It was all relief from anxiety. It was all relief from depression. It was all relief from overthinking. But then at some point, it starts making you overthink. And then you start to feel you're more productive without it. You're more calm without it. That's just a weird thing to go through. And not everyone goes through it. Like, for example, Kid Cudi, Snoop Dogg, they still smoke in their 30s and 40s and stuff. And it seems to not affect them that way. But I do wonder if behind the scenes they're taking tolerance breaks and these types of things that we don't see. And it makes me um, wonder, a question I have for you is, is there a way to uh, change whatever the epigenetics are doing to better your relationship with it so that it gets back to that very peaceful state of bliss when you smoke cannabis? Is it just a tolerance break? Is it something you can take to kind of maybe, you know, reinvigorate your nervous system to, to, to accept it better? You know, what would you say? Yeah. You know, I, I think there's a lot of ways to answer that question. Um, what I'll say first, I'll just, you know, speak from my experience that I think in a lot of ways parallels yours, you know, I got really into weed when I was, um, you know, maybe 14 or 15 and, um, was an everyday stoner until I was, you know, 24, 25, and then just hit this wall where it was like, this is freaking me out. And it was in, yeah. and it was in combination with some really difficult relationship 
stuff that was happening for me at the time. Sure, sure. And the stress of that, you know, it was like every time I would smoke, it would bring up this stuff that was right. really painful and really hard to deal with. And uh, I didn't, I didn't have the tools to deal with it, you know, at that mm -hmm. time. And um, so, you know, in terms of set and setting, there's the set, there's the mindset piece of it being like, uh, you know, really ch ch shifted and changed. And it's not like that was an isolated thing, like all of a sudden this stressful thing caused it. It was looking back, you know, a lot of unprocessed shit, mm -hmm. you know, minor traumas and, you know, limiting beliefs and things that um, I, I hadn't worked through or understood that I even needed to work through yet. Mm -hmm. And cannabis was a really good way for to just kind of keep that at bay and mm -hmm. use it as a crutch not to have to deal with the uh, and take responsibility for, for my shit. Right. So like, mm -hmm. that's what I was doing. I think in a lot of ways, you know, in my teenage years and early twenties where like, it felt really good to smoke because it was a break from normal reality. It was a break mm -hmm. from, um, you know, feeling like I'm in my head and I don't really like it there. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then it's like that, I feel like that only works for so long if that's what you're using it for. And there's lots of ways to use cannabis. I don't want to make it seem like anyone that uses cannabis is hiding from their shit. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just a really easy way to do it. If, if that's, you know, what you're doing. I think that's part of the trickster aspect of it is that it is really difficult to realize that's what you're doing, you know, as you're doing it, because it just feels really good. Um, mm -hmm. You know? Um, right. So I, I, for, for me, I'll say the biggest thing that has changed the subjective ex experience of using cannabis has been doing a lot of inner work, like actually, you know, going and resolving some of that stuff, uh, developing resiliency, stress management tools and ways to think about, um, you know, way to, ways to ground and, and be in touch with my body. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I think there's like an aspect of, um, you know, kind of having like, uh, um, the, the image that's coming to mind is like take, doing the laundry, you know, of the mind. Like if you're, if you're doing the laundry every day and it's not building up, you know, there's less chance that when you smoke weed, it's going to shine this big light on this pile of, of dirty clothes that are taking up, you know, <laughs> half the room. Right. right. Um, and so that, that's stuff that can, you know, bring up anxiety. So, mm -hmm. so that, that's my first answer is, and you know, from the psychological layer. Uh, right. The second one is, you know, we really don't know what the physiology side of that looks like, you know, uh, just, there's not a good understanding of it. Um, and yet there, there's mo most certainly, you know, some physical things that probably have changed in your body and in my body, um, you know, the way the endocannabinoid system is balanced and wired and regulated and these, you know, tight feedback loops and things like that, that when you, you know, add cannabinoids in, it's going to kind of shift the system and then maybe take some time to adjust. Um, mm. And I think that when a lot of people think about it, they're like, um, you know, thinking about like, you know, is this going to like talking about like long-term effects? Uh, mm. You know, is this going to like hurt my memory or is this going to, um, you know, help me with this, condition or whatever it is but i think there's a lot of very subtle things that we have no idea what's going on you know when you mm -hmm. use a substance every day like that for for a while and it could right. be positive could be not but i don't know right um, right that's really interesting um so when it comes to how you said doing this inner work to kind of you know do the laundry so to speak so that when you smoke maybe you know, you have a clean slate there and these things aren't coming up, you know, how, how does one start? Uh, how would you recommend one starts to do that, to go inward, to start doing this inner work? Hmm. I mean, I feel like that looks a lot, it looks pretty different for, for everyone, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I, I feel like finding a good therapist is always a, a helpful mm -hmm. thing to do. Yeah, um, I agree. And, and finding one that you actually fit well with, cause you know, it's just like any, human relationship you're not going to jive with everyone and they're not going to sure. jive with you and I, I feel like that's one of the things about therapy that is, is kind of hard to explain because a lot of people don't have good experiences with it right. and it's the same thing of like well if you just walked up to this guy on the street and started talking with them you know he might not be the right match for you so sometimes it takes a little bit sure, um, 
but actually, as you were saying that, I, I was thinking about what you said before about like nightmares, you know, like well, what yeah. are these nightmare things about? Uh, and, and I feel like it's very related to the same type of stuff that gets brought up or amplified with cannabis or a yeah. psychedelic. Uh, you know, it's, it's latent material in the, that you haven't dealt with, you know, it's, it's mm -hmm. stuff that is threatening or scary or, you know, um, dark. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that part of the, um, I'd say a big part of that process is accepting that darkness and accepting the parts of ourselves that we're, we're not, that are not good, quote unquote, or, or not, you know, socially acceptable. And, and sure, yet, the shadow the, as they call it. Right. In psychology. And, yeah. And yet it's not going away. It's certainly not going away. It's, uh, mm -hmm. it's going to be around. So might as well learn to live with it and love it and feel, you know, figure out where it fits in. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I feel like, um, Man, that's such a broad question. It's, uh, yeah. it's like where 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 do you start with your own personal I, I, I transformation experience or your your own process? It's like, mm -hmm. um, well, I remember you saying something in another podcast about meditation having effects on your epigenetics. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like meditation might be a way to deal with these things, perhaps, and or. Uh, start your body's healing process um you know and and of course if cannabis is making you have anxiety every time you smoke it admitting to yourself that it's not helping even though you love it you know is a hard thing to do um but meditation might be able to calm your nerves because a lot of times when you get habituated to this thing you know you you feel you you might need it to feel normal it's part of your daily habit um and it's still you know, now you're, you're doing it even though it's not helping and it's a hard thing to admit to yourself. Sometimes this is something I've been going through mm -hmm. that it's not helping anymore. Even because again, I have this romance with it where it's like, I thought I was going to smoke for life. Right. So and, like yeah. when it, when it stops feeling great, it's a weird thing, you know? Um, but I did want to speak to, you know, what meditation may be able to do, uh, epigenetically. Yeah. Um, before we jump into that, I want to speak to the, what you're talking about, you know, sure. realizing that cannabis isn't helping anymore. Right. Um, it can be really hard um, from an identity perspective yeah. to say, to all of a sudden be like, wait a minute, I had this sense of self built up around being a stoner and being in relationship with this plant. Mm -hmm. And it can feel like a betrayal. You know, it can feel mm -hmm. like a betrayal from the plant that you've developed this relationship. And it's like, you know, what did I, what did I do to deserve this or, or right. you know, like that. And, uh, you know, I, I feel like that's a really real thing that, that can keep people stuck because it's like, okay, you know, if, if this isn't my identity anymore, then, then what is, what, what replaces it? And I think it actually can create a little bit of a existential vacuum or crisis around like, you know, mm -hmm. how, how do I... Um, how do I, you know, who am I? How do I know myself? What, are, and, you know, there's so many layers to that, but daily habits and, um, you know, having, uh, you know, existing or occupying a certain, uh, mental space that cannabis creates, like there's a, there's a solid sense of, of self that can be tied into that. Yeah, especially when you're a musician and or a label owner, mm -hmm. which I am, because it really makes music this immersive experience. Um, and, you know, it, you know, you, you start to love this combination of good music and cannabis. Um, and that's almost, you know, and of course, psychedelics played a role in my appreciation for music, too, because in my psychedelic experiences, music was, was what was guiding it mm -hmm. so i was literally like music is the most important medicine there is you know like psychedelics are great medicine but without music would they would it be doing what it's doing music seems like the the fundamental thing here like psychedelics are just amplifying what music's doing so like i i feel like music is uh, one of the most important things uh that humanity has created um and that's why i've thrown myself into learning music becoming a musician and then also like putting it on a platform under time wheel 
Um, but then, you know, again, it, it's this weird sense of the identity crisis when the thing that guided you to what you've built your life around is no longer working in the way it once did. What do you do? You know? <laughs> yeah, man, I can, I can relate on a lot of levels, <laughs> on a lot of levels, mm-hmm. both about weed and actually about music itself. Um, for me, I, I um, is it that, just a coming of age? Is it just, hey, you're a grown up now. Get out of your little fantasy world, you mm-hmm. know? But, but I don't know. I I feel like it's a tolerance thing. Like my intuition right now is saying, take a little break, you know, come back to it. Maybe it'll be magic again. Maybe you've been abusing it. Maybe you've not been holding it uh, sacred mm-hmm. as a ceremonial uh, plant. You've been kind of just having it as this default way of being and that's not it's so powerful it is such a powerful plant to not hold it in this sacred regard maybe that's the spirit of the plant saying dude come on you know you know how sacred this is why are you why are you using it this way um that's kind of what my intuition is 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 saying to me about it yeah for sure for sure and um so my, my work as a, as a coach, you know, is a, is a lot about helping people understand their bodies and like learn, you know, what are the supplements and herbs and nutrition that works well and, you know, say promotes good sleep. So, you know, I, I've worked with a lot of people on like, okay, now that I'm not smoking weed anymore, like what can I use instead to help me sleep? Right. Um, you know, and it's like, I think you can look at that kind of across the board and I'll bring it back to meditation here. Like, you know, mm-hmm. what, what are the things that I, what are, what are the things I get from, from cannabis? You know, what are the things that it does for me? Um, and if I'm choosing to not use it because I want to take a break and respect it in the way that I think it deserves and treat it as a sacred tool, for taking mm-hmm. medicine. Um, okay. How can I get those same benefits maybe in another way? Yeah. Um, and meditation certainly ca- fills a part of that. And it certainly has its own benefits that you don't get from, from cannabis too. Um, and I'll, I'll say that like med- meditation is plays a pretty big role in, in my life and um, I'm not very good at it, but, but I do it, you know? And, and um, I don't know, it's, it's taken, it took me 10 years to make it a regular daily practice. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, I, I, I feel like there's just so many myths around meditation and like mm-hmm. what it's like to meditate most of the time, it feels like you're not doing it right. Mm-hmm. You know? And, mm-hmm. and, and I just, I, this is my like new talking point. My new thing that I want people to know about meditation is yeah. that it doesn't matter if you're good at it. Like it doesn't matter if you can focus your mind on your breath. Mm-hmm. It just matters that you keep trying to do it. Like the process itself is really the meditation more so than achieving this thing or being in this certain state. And it's like those states and, and those places of, of feeling oneness or feeling like you are aware, more aware of yourself in, cer- in a certain way. It's mm-hmm. just a natural extension of just continuing to do the process that you're not very good at. You know, it's mm-hmm. like the, um, yeah, I, I just, um, I, I encounter so many people that say, well, I can't meditate. I can't clear my mind. Um, and I'm, uh, and then my response is just like, yeah, yeah, that's not really, that's like kind of the point, but you mm-hmm. definitely can still meditate. Right. You know? I actually, I said that on a podcast with my brother once. Um, cause, uh, he has a show as well that I'm kind of a regular guest on. And, uh, cause I actually have taught meditation and, uh, I'm pretty well practiced in it. Um, Uh, And what I said is for people who, you know, they expect to enter into blissful awareness when they meditate. And because it doesn't happen for them the first dozen times they try it, they give up on it and say, I'm not good at it. It's not working for me. So I'm I'm done. I'm I'm done with the practice. Um, And then I kind of said a similar thing that you said, but I said it as just sit down, close your eyes and think. Mm -hmm. Don't expect to enter blissful awareness don't expect your thoughts to disappear don't expect you know to only be able to focus on your breath if you sit down close your eyes and just let your thoughts go and observe them i think over time they'll start to quiet Mm 
they'll start to finally, and you'll finally, maybe it takes 30 times, but finally you'll get a glimpse of that blissful awareness. You'll finally, it'll finally hit you. And in your sober reality, you know, in your daily reality, you'll feel more calm and you'll say, oh, wait, the meditation's working now. It, but you got to stick with it though. And, but again, there is this big expectation with all these spiritual gurus talking about how amazing meditation is. And when they don't get the amazing experience, they kind of feel like, ah, it's just not meant for me, or I'm not good enough at it, or, you know, like, uh, I don't have 10 years to put into this before I get a good effect from it. But I was just say, as I said before, sit down and think, you know, sit down with your eyes closed and think. Because um, the thoughts are, are loud for most people. It's like this big loud thing in their head all day they're hearing not audibly but you know so i don't know how you hear it if not audibly but there's this thing that these thought patterns we go through and and people expect meditation to be a full release from that but you know not until you're practiced in it and it's funny because i had an experience where my brother bought this tool that apparently tracks your brain waves or something like that <clears throat> it's this uh little headpiece you put on and it connects to an app on the phone and i had been meditating for five or eight years or something before i tried this once and it was funny i had this kind of ego moment where i was like oh i'm gonna get a good score on this because i've been practicing and i got a terrible score and i was like what well we, we can start the competitive meditation league that's uh <laughs> exactly yeah. you know it's just funny because you think you build up this muscle to the point you know, like imagine in the gym, someone had been working out for a while. Well, a certain weight is going to be easy to them compared to another person. Well, in meditation, it's not always the case. You know, like even if you practice for five years, maybe you have a bad meditation that day. And, and you know, it kind of made me, I don't know if this is just a defense mechanism, but it kind of made me think, ah, this tool doesn't work. <laughs> but I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I certainly didn't stick with it, though, because... Part of me was like, this isn't what meditation is about. It's about sitting quiet, not reading your brain waves and trying to like get a good score. You know, it's funny. Like um, the thing about those devices is they're measuring, you know, a specific frequency that, again, it comes down to individual brains. Like I, I the I, I used to work with this this health clinic. Uh, and it, it was based, you know, it was a peak performance clinic, a lot of really high performing people. And the funny thing is whenever they would run a, a QEEG, like the, you know, brain mapping, those people would appear as abnormal because they were abnormal on the other end of the range, like outside of the normal curve. Right. So like their brain waves would actually be representative of like these unique talents and skills and like, um, you know, being an outlier in the, the high range of performance. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so like, while I feel like devices like that can be useful, um, you actually have to kind of be wary of sometimes like training out abnormal frequencies from people that, mm -hmm. you know, might actually be doing something positive for them. So mm -hmm. I'll just say that, you know, may, that brain, that device may not have been picking up on what feels like and is useful meditation for you, which, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you know, in terms of the epigenetics of meditation, um, there's a lot of really cool research that's been done the past 10 years or so that validates the, you know, kind of obvious benefits to anyone who's been doing it for a while or anyone that's, um, you know, been in, you know, a wisdom tradition that uses meditation. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, regular meditation shown to change the function and expression of about 4,000 different genes. Uh, a lot of genes that are, you know, beneficial for immune function and um, longevity, cardiovascular health. Um, I just saw, I was just talking about a study with a friend who they like had people do, I think it was like eight weeks of mindfulness meditation and then um, looked at um, uh, plaque on their arteries of their heart found you know lower lower plaque from meditation so wow. it's like yeah and, and, and so it's and you know the the thing about when you look at stuff from the epigenetic perspective is it gives you this really deep core systemic understanding of how something can impact so many other systems in the body um, mm -hmm. because epigenetics i like to look at it as almost like a central hub 
that connects all these different pieces. Um, you know, and it, it's it's the it's the rationale as to how um, you know nutrition, exercise, meditation, toxins from the environment, relationships, and stress. Uh, you you name it. You encounter it in your you, in something that you can encounter in your life. Like it has an epigenetic effect, and it has an effect on health. So epigenetics act uh, acts in this way as this like thing that levels the playing field between all those different things and then acts as something that can allow those things to influence so many different systems and, and functions in the body. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's not surprising if you've been looking at it from this lens that, Oh, meditation can impact, um, you know, heart disease and, and cardiovascular right. plaque. Um, right. It's an extension of the way that, um, you know, meditation influences the nervous system and then the nervous system influences the immune system and all these other parts of the body. And, um, right. you know, it's this, this ripple effect. So I, I feel like meditation is one of those things, um, that just like, th there's almost nothing. It's not going to benefit. The only thing I will say is like short term, it can make things worse before it gets better, you know, in terms of like, um, all of a sudden sitting with your thoughts, being really present with your body. And mm -hmm. there can be some pretty activating, uncomfortable stuff that comes up through that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I think that's another thing that can sometimes steer people away is like, Oh, I'm, I'm forced to confront my thoughts now that have been running mm -hmm. automatically in my head. And that's, that's mm -hmm. not fun, mm -hmm. uh, but that's the way through. That's the, that's the work. That's the process. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, in order to start seeing those benefits, I wonder, okay, so obviously daily meditation, but for how long is it just as long as you can go, you know, or is there kind of a, uh, in any research you've come across a, a, uh, ideal amount of time? It's a good question. I don't have a number off the top of my head. I, I have a sense that about 10 to 15 minutes is going to be the minimum daily to really see consistent good results over you know it takes a while you know at least six months to a year uh and then i think there's increasing benefits years down the road five years ten years you see pretty significant differences in, in regions of the brain between you know 15 20 year meditators or someone who's been doing it for three months like there's just that mm -hmm. long-term slow um it's like a you know water carving out a canyon type yeah, of thing absolutely yeah i think i'm remembering this correctly um but um cory allen who was recently on the show i believe he meditates two hours a day that is something to to look up to i would say for myself if I could do two hours a day, I feel like I would be making leaps and bounds <laughs> in my life. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, I'm currently at a 15 minute a day, uh, pretty regular habit. Um, sometimes miss a day, but for the most part, 15 minutes a day. And it goes by quick, goes by easy. Um, and I love it. But, you know, so uh, that's, I'm glad we got to touch on that because I was kind of wondering, you know, I know what it's doing for calming my mind. But I didn't know until I started studying some of your work recently by listening to these podcasts and stuff that I could actually be helping my entire body by meditating. That's really interesting. I don't think enough people talk about that. They only say meditate and you'll feel better. They don't really say meditate and your body can get healthier, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's a huge resilience factor, um, both from, you know, a, a mental and emotional stress perspective and how the body responds to physical stress. Like there's, right. um, you know, studies related to like better recovery for athletes after heavy exercise, you know, the body's just like has more of a capacity to be flexible and mm -hmm. respond to, you know, stuff that comes up. It's like the, the, um, the breath is just such a powerful tool to, you know, really be able to kind of fine tune the way the body responds to whatever is thrown at it. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's, uh, 
yeah, it's been a struggle for me. <laughs> I'll be honest, like over the years, like I, I've, I've, and, I, and now I, I meditate about an hour, hour and a, hour and a half, um, most days. That's um, awesome. That's great work. Yeah. Thank you. But it's, uh, it's been a, a major challenge to, to mm-hmm. get there. And if I, it, you know, this is about a two year practice now, um, mm-hmm. of that being stable. Um, mm-hmm. but I, what, I, what but, do you find as the benefits for yourself? Yeah. I'd say that the, the biggest benefit that I, I noticed is just that capacity to like recognize what I'm thinking in the moment and then make a choice that I actually consciously want to make rather than a knee jerk reaction to something. Sure. You know, it's the, it's the, um, it's the being told you're going to have to wait an extra 15 minutes for this thing and not freaking out or like, right. you know, having someone say something that I could perceive as negative or insulting or something like that. And then being able to go, huh? Yeah. That's not actually really about me. This person's having a bad day. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, like those little things internally, it it allows for space. It allows for space to um, become aware of what thoughts are just gonna come out unless you recognize what the, the process is and, uh, it's like more degrees of freedom within every situation. Absolutely. I love that. I love that. I think that's something everyone could benefit from because yeah, in this day with so much information coming at you from so many platforms, social media wise and email and text message and, uh, just being out in the world, you know, like, uh, I feel like it's really testing the patience of the human animal. Like <laughs> we did not evolve to, to have this much, information daily um and uh we try to keep up with it you know and you know it it could have health consequences by trying to keep up with it um but if you learn the tools to kind of you know regulate the system and make more informed decisions um more conscious decisions you know like to not continuously scroll for an extra 15 minutes you know you you have the presence of mind to say oh i did what i came to do on this social platform i'm going to close it now instead of just like oh i'm here and my dopamine's firing off at rapid speeds and i'm and all of a sudden an hour went down the drain right you know it's like i i definitely think that meditation can help people enjoy the sim- simple parts of life too a little more you know just Sometimes after meditation, I'll step outside and I'll just be in awe of the beauty of the trees. And I'm like, this is nice. You know what I mean? I I wish everyone would see this, you know, and I don't always see it every day, you know, but when I do, I'm just so grateful. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, totally. And and it's like, I still swear a lot on Facebook and get sucked in all the time. But, Mm -hmm. you know, the I'd like to think that it's a little less frequent because I do have that presence of mind to turn it off at some point yeah. um, or, or at least allow myself to really deeply be present and en- enjoy the, the slacking off of it, you know, like, like sure. it's, it's the, it's those types of like the, like the, the really mindful embodied presence for something like smoking weed or for mm-hmm. something like eating a cheeseburger from Wendy's. It's like, like mm-hmm. if I'm going to do that shit, I want to be as present as fucking possible so that i you know it's like and and so meditation is like a practice for that in a way Mm -hmm. it's like it's the um there's a um and a just the attention focusing aspect of it i feel like is really helpful for deeply deeply engaging with life and and the way that you're talking about 100 percent. well said um i do have one more kind of topic i had been pondering on uh your your thoughts on which is in relation to cannabis and epigenetics. And as I mentioned earlier, the fact that some people, it just doesn't rub them the right way. And other people, it's an amazing time. I wonder a similar thing about psychedelics, Mm -hmm. because psychedelics are regularly touted as being able to provide transformative experiences that can change your life and change your relationship to yourself and to nature and to uh, other people and, you know, all of this. But certainly some people uh, don't get those benefits and it might actually be a scarring experience for them. Is there in your mind, you know, a a role in epigenetics of how someone might react to magic mushrooms or LSD or DMT or ayahuasca or these things? 
Uh, I would say most likely. Um, you know, there's there's most likely an interplay between um, genetics as far as um, you know, kind of someone's baseline genes, right? Like we were talking about with the cannabis, there may be some things that um, be from a. I mean, it's really hard to say exactly what, where that might lie, right? It might lie in the serotonin receptor system. You know, um, there's lots of genetic variants there. And, and some people might just be set up to not respond well to those type of compounds. Um, on the other side of things, um, you know, I think you really do have to look at, you know, what is the mindset going in? How are you approaching it? It's definitely set and setting too, but there's a feedback loop between epigenetic changes that happen from it, the set and setting itself, and then what you do with the experience after the fact, um, you know, in terms of how, how do you actually apply what you experienced into your life? How do you ground it? How do you anchor it and turn something that is this just, you know, expanded sense of reality and self and, you know, an ecstatic state, how do you actually translate that into the small daily micro steps that lead you towards the version of the, of yourself that you saw was possible in that state. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I think I'm going to get this quote wrong, uh, but it was from a paper that Rosalind Watts put out, I think this year, um, who, she's one of the lead investigators in um, the psilocybin for depression studies in, in the UK. Um, mm -hmm. And the, the quote is something like psychedelics open up the, the oyster to expose the pearl, but it's what happens afterwards that determines whether the oyster stays opened or closed. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's what you do in the process with that experience, you know, it's, it's, do you form new habits? Do you start thinking about things differently or do you just kind of slip back into the same thing and, you know, not really make any changes um, and then go back to that experience again and again to seek the ecstatic state that feels like it's, it's the thing that's going to change you, but it's not, it's going to be the thing that might give you some insight and some ways to make changes. But the stability of it, I feel like is always based on the chop wood, carry water, Saturnian yeah. nature of, of the, the daily ritual and habit, which it's not sexy. It's not mm -hmm. like, it's not the, the, you know, this thing is going to magically change your life. Like, yeah, there may be some, some, you know, spontaneous things that do happen for some people. And that's, you know, amazing. Um, and I'm not discounting psychedelics ability to do that at all. Um, but I, I think there's more focus on the psychedelic experience itself than what it can catalyze and then be translated into on a practical, pragmatic daily basis, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that, um, developing some type of daily spiritual practice is one of the best ways to ground that. And that could be meditation. It could be yoga. It could be mantra, um, there's a ton of things um, that you could do to kind of remember that space. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's that's the primary way of, to integrate is to develop some type of spiritual practice if you want to stay in touch with that. You know, because some people again have these scarring experiences and they don't want to remember that space. Yeah. <laughs> they want to forget it as soon as possible. Um, so. I don't know. That's that's my little take on it. But I did always wonder, uh, is the predisposition towards spiritual experience something that could be in the genes, that could be in the codes? Yeah, you know? there actually is some interesting research on um, different genes. You know, people are wired for spiritual experiences. Like, yeah, there, there's definitely some things around... Um, uh, likelihood for mystical type experiences. Uh, there's something called the absorption trait or like the ability to get absorbed in your own thoughts and fantasies and, and mind that um, actually does really correlate with intensity of psychedelic experiences, but also does have some correlations with some genetics too. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there, there's probably a range, you know, it's probably a spectrum of people that are, um, you know, have naturally very thin boundaries, uh, with 
other realms or ways of experiencing self. Uh, you know, there's going to be your psychics and your people that are, you know, just mm-hmm. kind of the, you know, tuned in and tapped into that kind of stuff. And then you have people that are probably, you know, regardless of, you know, I, I think that it's possible to have spiritual experience for everyone, but some people are going to be harder nuts to crack and, and that may have, you know, some genetic components to it for sure. Right. Like imagine if someone's ancestors were Vikings, these hardened warriors, right? Hmm. It's like these like very ego, ego, uh, centered, you know, like, uh, conquerors, like they might not be so lovey dovey, you know, when it comes to being cracked open and, and seeing the oneness of everything. I've certainly had that thought before, like, Um, But at the same time, uh, like a contradicting thought is Vikings use mushrooms, but they also use mushrooms to kill people. So it's kind of (laughs) right. Yeah. And that brings up the, you know, I, 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 the, the constantly reoccurring theme of, well, you know, they're neutral, they're tools. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can use a tool however you want. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Well, um, before we go, tell me a little about this new EP. Um, when it was going to drop, what's the concept, what's the name, anything you have to share? Yeah, so I don't know when it's going to drop or where. Um, it's called Underground. I know that much. Uh, it's awesome. four, four tunes. And yeah, i got to figure out exactly what to do with them. Uh, probably going to do it as a charity release. Um, awesome. Similar to the last album I did. But yeah, I don't know exactly where, where and when yet. I just uh, have it finally done so that's a beautiful thing you know like to to not be overly wrapped up in in the release i i i like that as well i'm very similar in my way of creation which is create to create you know create to find fulfillment it's not just to get the props at the end of the day because you know uh some people are very into music for the the uh the glory you know when some of us are into the music for the experience of creation and channeling our emotions into these um soundscapes that others can you know and including ourselves uh, i mean i honestly i feel like when i first started creating music i made it for me um to encapsulate something to to remember something mm-hmm. to put an experience somewhere into an archive so to speak to uh to to call back to later in life and then the fact that other people enjoy it is just a bonus you know Right. Yeah. You know, it, it's interesting. And I, I think I alluded to something about just like the cycles of, you know, identity of, of, as a musician, like that's definitely how I started just fucking around, you know, making stuff for myself, um, encapsulating experiences. And then over time, I think I kind of got sucked into the industry uh, mm-hmm. need to promote yourself and be a public figure and, you know, do the release thing and be on social media and, um, it never really felt good to me. Um, I know a lot of artists that think that way yeah, as well. Yeah. And, um, and so, you know, this and the last out, like I have a, you know, pretty decent coaching career, you know, I don't need to make money with my music now. And it's really nice to have that freedom to be able to just say, all right, I am going to write music for me. I actually really, you know, I'd love for people to hear it. I'd love for people to enjoy it. Um, but is it going to, you know, make or break me if, if, if it's a quote unquote success or not? Like, no, it's still going to be meaningful to me and the music I make. So, um, I'm personally like really happy with kind of like where I'm at right now, just in my own personal relationship to music and it's taking me a little bit of time to get back to this place and uh, mm-hmm. kind of celebrating a little bit of that through this release, like, they're, they're, like with this, the, these these tunes, I, I very intentionally was not as perfectionistic as I have been in the past. I was very intentionally like, I'm going to write this. I want it to be done quick. I want to I want it to encapsulate this feeling and this experience. And I'm going to write these songs. I'm going to put them out, and that's it. You know? mm-hmm. It's funny how the the arc of the music career, it's it seems like a lot of people go through similar things. You know, you're, you're not alone in that feeling, that feeling of changing your relationship to creation and being less perfectionist about it and, 
and doing it uh, with more simple goals in mind and not to make a million dollar record and, you know, all this stuff. It's funny how, I mean, don't get me wrong. I'll take a million dollar record. If someone's <laughs> offering like, yes, but <laughs> uh, yeah, I know what you're saying too. That's funny. That's funny. Well, thank you so much, David. This has been absolutely amazing. Uh, I got a lot out of it and I hope the listeners did as well. Uh, so where can we find uh, more from you, your websites? Yeah. Stuff? So my, my coaching website uh, is david com, And I've got articles on there, some videos. Um, if anyone's interested in you know seeing about working together as well, you can contact me on there. Uh, and then SoundCloud is probably the best way to find my music. I'm on Spotify and the other things too, but I, I think the um, most comprehensive collect- collection of stuff is on SoundCloud. So, Wonderful. There. so we would just look up Few Texture. Yeah, soundcloud.com slash Few Texture. Love it. All right. Thank you, brother, for joining. Thanks for having me.